Well, good morning. <laughs> I can't believe uh, another year has come and gone, right? This has been probably the slowest, fastest year that I've experienced. I don't know if you guys can relate to that, um, but I just can't believe that we're here again celebrating our graduates and families for all that they've accomplished this last year. And, and as we celebrate um, another school year done and, and moving up even, where this is grad Sunday, but it's also promotion Sunday because kids are moving up. Um, and so I, I don't know how many teens and, and kids I have in the room, but if you would quickly stand up, I'm going to embarrass you just a little bit. So if you can stand up, even kids, kids stand up. You guys did it. You finished another year. Like this is, and it was a hard year, <laughs> right? So this is my, you can have a seat. This is my fifth Grad Sunday celebration with you all. And typically over the years, if you've been around, I have spent the first little bit giving some advice, if you will. Top 10 lists that I scour the internet for as things we wish we would have learned in high school or advice for the future. So this year I thought it would be uh, fun to gather some advice from our congregation. So some of you have put some input on this. And, and so here we're gonna do the top 10 things. I've never used the slideshow, so hopefully it works. <laughs> Nope. Okay, go ahead. I'm just going to be kind of yelling at you. <laughs> Number 10, don't burn bridges at work. I think this is like so important, right? Like, especially if you plan on being there for a while. Don't bridge bridges. Don't burn bridges at work. Number nine, um, finances. So I had a lot of, under this umbrella, we had taxes and learn how to, your credit score works and budgeting and all of that stuff. And Seriously though, taxes, I will never forget Adam and I uh, sitting down, I don't think we were married yet, but it was the first time we did taxes. And we were sitting over these papers and we're like, what do we do? So we had to call our parents. Um, <laughs> number eight is work hard at everything you do. Absolutely. Number seven, you are never done learning and growing, right? This is in all areas of life. Number six, don't be too proud to admit when you're wrong and give an apology. That was good. Number five, don't let one class ruin your education. Now, some of you are not going to go to college, and that's totally fine. But some of you are, and you might have professors you don't like or a class that you don't like because it's not fit in your major, and it's just something you have to take. Don't let that ruin your education. Number four, you don't have to go to college to be successful, right? My husband went to college, and now he has a business, and he's not doing what he went to college for. <laughs> so it's all right. He probably didn't need to go to college. Uh, number three, you have family and you have family. Sometimes the latter can be better for your heart. Number two, always be honest and kind. And number one, be patient, worry less, trust God more. So when I was younger, I worried about the fact that God called me into ministry and I didn't feel remotely worthy of that great responsibility. And then in college, I worried about my grades, who I would marry, what would happen after college. By the time I finished college and was nearing the end of my master's and was seven months pregnant with Jackson, we worried if a church would hire someone so close to their due date. They didn't. So then we worried about what we would do next. So we bought a house sight unseen in Southern Oregon. We worried about finances because Adam was the only one working for a little while. And then when we moved to Salem for a new ministry assignment and when we moved up here, we worried about whether or not we were following God's plan for us. We've had our fair share of worries about finances. I know you all can relate to that. We worried about whether or not we would be able to have a third child because of some health problems I had a couple of years ago. We have worried about our kids in so many ways we couldn't even begin to get all of that out. We've had a whole new slew of worries over the last year and a half. We've worried through things, all the while knowing we should just trust God. But I think that's easier said than done sometimes. In fact, I know it is because you all have worried too. I reached out on Facebook and, and many of you um, had given me some worries in your lives and so I'm gonna kinda quickly go through these. You worry about your kids and your spouse and your family and their safety. You worry about family in general and finances. Am I being enough for my kids or my family or my business? Having a roof over my head, medical debt, medical scares, kids, family, and friends' salvation. Overthinking situations in our lives, work, what others might do with their free will, car accidents, living long enough to see our kids grow up, for our country, health, physical and mental concerns for others, just to name a few. We all worry, 
And we all get anxious over various things. And Jesus knew that we were going to have this problem. That is why he spoke right into this issue. And over the years, I've come back to a particular passage in my grad Sunday sermons. I do this because it made an impact on me as a high school student. Um, when it was my turn to graduate, my youth pastor gave us these crosses. I still have mine. He made them. And the inscription is Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This quickly became my favorite verse, and a verse I turn to time and time again when I have spoken with our teens on grad Sundays. And I, and I often talk to the teens about shifting up their words a little bit to seek first Christ in all that you do. So I, I haven't really unpacked this whole passage before in a grad Sunday sermon, which is a little surprising because it is my favorite verse. So this morning, we're going to be unpacking the entire passage leading up to that. And that's Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And I'm, I want to read through the passage, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit more. So if you want to turn to Matthew 6, if you brought a Bible or you have an app, or I'm also going to have it up on the screen. So read along with me or listen as I read Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. I'm going to use my Bible, but it's up there. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I just realized that I never turned this on. That's probably why it's not working. <laughs> okay, we'll see if it works a little bit. Uh, now, if you know much about scripture, you might know that chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew is what is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And if you aren't familiar with this, that is totally fine. I know there are some kids in this room or even teens and adults who might not know this. And the Sermon on the Mount is pretty much what it sounds like. Jesus saw crowds gathering and decided it was time to teach and preach to those crowds. So he went onto a mountainside, sat down, and began to teach. Today's passage is a continuation of teachings from Jesus. So we're going to go right back to the very beginning. I know I just read it, but we're going to go right back to the very beginning, and I'm going to hope that this works. Yes. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Now, as we read the rest, read the rest of this passage earlier, you might have noticed that worry was a theme in this passage. But what are some different variations of worry? Some translations say, take no thought. And if you look at the Greek, and I'm not going to um, say the Greek word because I didn't take Greek like Craig, and I won't be able to pronounce it, and it won't be pretty. So, but if you look at the Greek, it says another way of describing this is to be anxious about, to have a distracting care. How many of you have distracting cares in your life? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and when I think of to be anxious, I think of another word that comes with it, and that is fear. And there are many variations of do not be afraid in scripture, do not worry. In fact, it's mentioned in scripture over 350 times, so it's definitely worth paying attention to. Now, what's interesting to me is that this dates back to Adam, the first man created by God. If you remember the story, even Adam sinned, and when they sinned, God went looking for them, and what did they do? They hid from God. And when they were questioned, Adam told God, I was afraid. Now, I believe from this point that fear or anxiety or worry has become the new norm throughout Scripture and in our lives now. But what's also interesting to me is looking at 1 John 4.18, where it says, and this is in your notes if you're doing that, perfect love drives out fear. But sin entered the world. So something we're thinking about is the fact that relationships can be fractured or cracked or broken because of sin entering into the world. In fact, relationships with God can be fractured, not 
God towards us necessarily, but, but sometimes us towards God. And relationships with others can be fractured or broken. So people, people are constantly plagued with anxiety and fears and worries, which often inhibit our ability to love and to be loved. Think about it. When you have had seasons where you might worry or have fears more than other seasons, did you ever feel distant from others or from God? Did you know that you should just be trusting in God, but something was just inhibiting you from doing so? Was it because you were giving into your fears or your worries or your anxiety? And yet here in Scripture it says, do not worry, do not be anxious, do not be fearful, because your life is more than those little things that you're worrying about. And worrying does not add to the span of your life. God cares more about you than he might about the birds or flowers. You are much more valuable to him. So don't worry so much. And yet, I read the list earlier. We worry. We get anxious. We can be fearful. We all do it, right? And and especially this last year and a half, there has been a lot to worry about. Life is already difficult, and then a, a pandemic and all that came with that, Um, it was that much more challenging. Just down to finishing off your 12 years of education, what an interesting and odd and hard way to end that. And because it is Grad Sunday and Promotion Sunday, um, and because many commented saying on Facebook that their main worry is their kids or spouse, I'm going to go focus on that just a little bit this morning. There are worries when it comes to the very beginning. Can I get pregnant? Will I have a good pregnancy that goes full term? And I especially think of those who we know have lost babies, and we have many in our, in our church over the years who have dealt with this. And there's a whole new slew of worries that come with that in future pregnancies. When we have babies, we worry about pretty much everything. Are they eating enough? Are they growing, developing the way they should? If you're my husband, did I accidentally touch their soft spot? As they get older, are they getting enough of the right nutrients? That's my fear. <laughs> Toddlers. You worry about all the bumps and bruises, how to discipline, what they're getting into. Elementary school years, you worry about if they're going to make friends, will they do well in school? Are they retaining the information they are learning, both good and bad information? Are they forming their faith? Middle school, will they find their place? Will they build on their own personal faith and go deeper? What extracurriculars might they choose? Will they start to date? Will they have emotional pain losing a friend or a breakup? Will they figure out who they are and what their identity is in and hope that it is in Jesus? And then high school, will they be able to manage school, work, friends, family, extracurriculars? Will they be safe when they start to drive? Will they let me know once they have arrived at said destination when they are driving? Will they make it home before curfew? Will they figure out what is next for after high school? Will they go to college? And if so, will they get into the one they want? Will they, there be enough money to send them? Will they make wise decisions? Will they deal with depression? Will they get hurt emotionally? Will they? Will they? Will they? This is just a few generics. I am sure as parents, you've experienced more fears and worries than what I just gave. For kids and teens, their worries are more along the lines of will. Will they like me? Will they laugh at me? Will I get hurt? Will I get all the work done? Will I get into college? Will I figure out what I want to do with my life? Will I? Y'all, we all worry about so many things. And if I can just be transparent here for a second, honestly, for me this last year, I have spent more time than I would like worrying about division. With the pandemic and masks and vaccinations, I see division in the U.S., yes. But what worries me even more is the division I've seen in the church capital C, but also even in our own church context. It's sticky and messy and hard, and it hurts my heart. So what do you worry about? What do you hold on to? What cares are distracting your heart and mind these days? Because we all have them, even when we know the answer is from our top 10 list. Be patient, worry less, and trust God more. And we can do that because of the things in this passage, like look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Birds don't sow or reap harvest, but God still feeds them. He cares about us that much more. This passage goes on to talk about how God will care for us. God loves us. God desires the best for us. And Jesus says all these things leading up to a very well-known and often used by me verse... But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. If we seek first his kingdom, God will bless us so we don't have to worry anymore. 
worry less, trust God more. Now, I know that's easier said than done, but here's something interesting. I looked into the Greek of kingdom, and again, I'm not going to say a word, but essentially, when we seek his, when we seek his kingdom, we are at any given time acknowledging his rule in our lives. We are giving our lives over to God. And, and then it goes on, the definition goes on to say, subjects of the kingdom are the objects of the care of God. You and I, when we accept Christ into our lives and we decide to live our lives fully for him, we are subjects of the kingdom. We are part of the family of God. And with that, we are, we are who God cares for. God cares for you more than the birds and flowers. God cares about you the most because he created you. But let's take it a little bit further. Subjects. I believe, are not just those who accept Christ into their lives. Though I do believe that God will bless those who are following after him and seeking God's guidance and discernment in their lives, but subjects is everyone. God created everyone. God loves everyone. We are all, whether you believe in God or not, a subject, a creation of God. And thus, God loves and cares for you. God loves and cares for us all. So when it comes to this conversation here about anxiety and worries, though, I do believe that if you are seeking Christ first, if you are seeking God's kingdom first, then your worries don't need to be as great, and you can trust in God's faithfulness more because you've seen it before. Because as much as life is materialistic, and our worries often have to do with materialistic things, and I don't just mean money, but earthly things, earthly worries, our lives are also spiritual, and we need to place God at the center of our lives, of our families, of our politics, of our everything. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to invade our soul and mind and life so that we don't have to worry about the little things or even the big things anymore. So quickly, I want to go back to the very beginning of the passage again. It starts with, therefore. Now, when a verse starts with that beginning, it is referring to the passage right before. And the passage right before talks about not storing up treasures in he on earth, but storing up treasures in heaven. Therefore, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about the treasures on earth. Don't worry about all the things we tend to worry about. But instead, seek first his kingdom. He will bless you. Now, does this mean we are not going to face trouble and with trouble have worries? <laughs> No. <laughs> At the very end, Jesus says that each day will have troubles of its own. Just because Jesus says not to worry is not based on the fact that believers are exempt from hardships. And with that, the feelings of anxiety, fear, and worry, we live in a sin-filled, free-will world. We will have trouble and suffering, as it says in John 16. There will always be some trouble in the day, and some days will be harder than others. But... Two things I want to say here with that. Number one, John 16 says, yeah, you're going to have trouble in this world, but take heart. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And in the troubles, God does promise to give us grace for the day. Lamentations tells us, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions or his mercies or his grace. Never fail. And they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Seek God's kingdom for ourselves. Yes, but also we have to remember to do so for others. I'm going to unpack that here in just a moment. So how do we get ourselves to the point of seeking the kingdom and letting go and trusting in God with our worries and our fears and our anxiety? Well, like I've been saying all morning, seek first Christ. Focus on your relationship with him. Graduates, you are about ready to truly enter adulthood. Don't let what you have learned about God and faith through your parents and the church and adults in your life waver. Stand strong in your beliefs and who Jesus is in your life. But also follow Jesus' example. He went around and loved on others. He taught them. He brought them into salvation so that they could have eternal life with him. Because we are a part of God's creation, God cares about us. God cares about you. God wants the absolute best for you to not live a life of worry or fear, but to live a life of joy and trust in his faithfulness. So to overcome worry, we have to focus on eternal things instead of temporary or fleeting things. Yes, there are a lot of great things um, that God has blessed us with here on earth, but that can't be the main thing we give our attention to. 
Also, there's a lot of hurt and pain and fear and things to worry about on earth. So focus on eternal matters. Focus on Jesus. Seek first Christ. To overcome worry, we have to focus on eternal matters. Now, I know I just said that, but beyond your relationship with Jesus and that side of eternal matters, there's another side here. Jesus came so that all might be saved. Make disciples of all nations. So stands to reason that a part of focusing on the kingdom is being like Christ and thinking of the salvation of others. Growing and building God's kingdom. Love God, love others. To overcome worry, we must focus more on God's providential care. We must recognize that because we are subjects of the kingdom, God cares about us. We must recognize our great value to God and know that even though we have troubles and we will have troubles, God will continue to care and love and give blessings. And you can trust in that because you've seen it. You've seen his faithfulness. You've heard about it from others. God can work in the troubles. I don't think that God desires for us to have hardships and troubles, but he can work in that. And last, I think to overcome uh, worry, we have to realize how unproductive it is. <laughs> I know that seems simple and, uh, and obvious maybe, but scripture told us today that it doesn't add anything to your life. Worrying does not add to your life. If anything, I think it takes away from what God might be able to do in your life in any given moment or season. Now, when a child is born, you have roughly 936 weeks until they graduate, which is this jar, if you can see it up here. It's very full, so I'm not going to pick it up. Um, but you have 936 weeks until they graduate. And many of you have heard this and know the marbles well over the years. And it goes fast. And there is a lot of hardships and a lot of joy and a lot of laughter and a lot of crying, a lot of worries. And this goes for the kids as much as it goes for the parents. There is a lot of prayer and investment that goes into raising God's children. Am I right, parents? You start at 936 weeks, and before you know it, they're entering first grade like my son, which is that second jar. And I was just showing him this morning because he was asking me about it. I said, this is where you are. <laughs> he just finished first grade. And, and I look at Jackson, I so often think, you were just a baby. Like, you were just a baby. How are you this amazing, talented, smart kid who is soaking up everything around you? And then I have people tell me often while I hold Jolene, our almost nine-month-old, that it goes by so fast. And I look at my two older sons and I think, yeah, <laughs> it definitely goes by fast. And I'm not ready for them to get any older. And I'm not ready for a day like this. And so I'm with you, grad parents. Um, it takes a lot of work and prayer. Um, and it goes by so fast. Because before you know it, your first grader is entering middle school. And that's that third jar right there, middle school. And then entering high school. And then for those of you sitting in this room who have seniors next year, I'm not sure if there's anybody in here right now, but, oh, that's not. 52 weeks left when they're entering into their senior year. I'm going to set that one up here. And um, for reference for my grandparents, I grabbed it. Oh, there it is. Just one marble. <laughs> now, some of you get the, the blessing of having them all summer. Some of the, your kids are leaving pretty quickly, actually. Um, 936 weeks to worry or 936 weeks to seek first his kingdom and trust in his faithfulness. A lifetime to worry or a lifetime to seek first his kingdom. Now, I'm not so delusional to not understand that we will all including me, have seasons where we let those worries in and overpower us. But I encourage you in those moments, though, to seek first Christ. And grads, you are about ready to enter into adulthood, and you're going to have a whole new slew of worries. Seek first Christ. Seek first his kingdom so that God might reveal his faithfulness and lift you up out of those hard feelings. Seek first his kingdom so he can use you and your story to reach others. Love God, love others, worry less. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to um, invite our, actually, I hope we have a slideshow. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, I'm going to pray for us. We have a slideshow of our grads, and then I'm going to invite them up here for a time of prayer. So um, watch the slideshow.
Ja, komm mal her. 12 years, plus or minus. <laughs> um, man, you guys did it. So if you are a grad in this room and are willing to come up here, I'd invite you up here. Um, I know some of you might not want to, but I'm, I'm uh, asking for you to come on up and have some gifts for you guys, and then we're going to pray over you. <laughs> I won't make you talk. <laughs> All right. Come on up, guys. Awesome. So um, this year, I, I always give uh, each grad a Bible. Um, the last couple of years, I've been doing uh, the Bibles that have the really large margins that you can make notes in. I just want and hope that as you guys are going through Scripture and you're leaning into your faith in God, that when God speaks to you, write it down. Write down everything that you're learning, everything that you're growing from. And, um, and my prayer is that you will open your Bibles often and you will lean into God's Word often. Um, and then I do have um, these keychains. I'm going to grab one out. Um, these keychains, I know, may be silly, but I hope you will put them on your, your key rings um, or your dorm keys or whatever. Um, but it does have Matthew 6.33 on it. Um, so my hope and my prayer for you is that you will seek first his kingdom in everything that you do. And I know that if you do, God will bless you. God will do amazing things in and through you guys, and we are so excited for you. Um, so we're going to spend some time in prayer this morning, I'm going to have the grads kind of go out into the aisles, and if you uh, feel comfortable enough to stand up and reach a hand out, extend a hand out, if you feel comfortable enough to surround them, especially if you're family, um, I would invite you to do that here in just a moment. Um, but the other thing, you guys probably saw the grad tables out in the lobby, I'm assuming. Um, go check those out afterwards. Each grad table has a piece of paper that says, I will commit to pray for you for a year at least. Um, and I encourage you, if, if you see a grad this morning or you go out there, pray about who you might pray about. Sign up to commit to pray for these grads for at least a year. Send them encouraging notes and thoughts throughout the year. Just invest in them a little bit as they enter into adulthood. So if you guys would like to kind of go into the aisles here and then those who are praying for them, um, come by them. Go ahead, guys, go. Just, nope, just, yeah, go find a spot in the aisles. <laughs> Just walk it around. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start over here, and then we'll come this way. So, yeah. All right. Let's pray. God, thank you for the ways in which you have shaped and formed and worked in and through Cody. Um, well, this guy... This guy is definitely something else. Um, it's been interesting watching from uh, the brotherly standpoint, from the family standpoint. I'm sure it's interesting to have watched him from the church family standpoint. Uh, you've shaped him. You've formed him. You've done some great, goofy, amazing, wonderful things. Um, and I'm interested to see what you continue to do. So I pray as we leave this place, as we celebrate graduation, all the goodness that comes with it, will we also lean in and look forward to what you're doing and what you're up to and what's next? Uh, would your spirit be with him? Would it be by your sanctifying grace that you make Cody into something new? Um, not just the Cody of what was, once was, but the Cody who is to become. By your grace, by your love, by your spirit, oh God. And would he always be reminded wherever he goes that he's deeply loved both by myself, my family, the church, um, but wholly and fully by you. So thanks for the ways in which you move, God. Thank you. Lord, thank you for Micah, uh, such a goofy, awesome, amazing kid who I've been blessed to know for a little while now and who's hung out in this space. Uh, thank you for, again, the ways in which you shaped him and formed him and uh, over the years have continued to move in and through him. And I pray as a potter works on clay, Lord, would you continue to shape and form him into something new, um, a vessel of your grace, unique, wonderful, um, used for your purposes. So continue to work in and through him over the years. Would he uh, lean in, seek your presence? Would he be reminded that your love um, shows up in many different ways? So would he have eyes to see and the heart to feel um, you and your presence in people and his surroundings and what is to come? Would he always lean into you? Thanks for what you do. I'm going to run over here. <laughs> If 
Father God, I thank you for Anna Badger. Thank you for uniquely and beautifully making this young lady. God, she has so much before her, so many options, many roads to take. And we know that you are faithful and we'll walk with her wherever she goes. God, I pray that you work on Anna's heart, that she follow you faithfully wherever she goes. That it's a partnership with you. God, we bless her. We send her off into this world wherever it takes her and ask that she'll be strong and courageous and faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up my daughter Zoe. One of my greatest joys. Lord, I, as we send her across the country, May she be a blessing to all that she knows. May your transformative power work in and through her to make your light shine in places that we cannot reach. I don't know what you have in store for her, but as a parent and as a pastor, I trust you, place you in her hand, place her in your hands. And we just ask that your grace and your mercy go before her and follow after her. In your gracious name I pray. Amen. God, I thank you um, for her future, whatever it may be with her. And I pray that no matter what happens and whether in the good and bad and stress and worrisome, but in the joy and happiness that is going to be her life, I pray that um, you just bless her and that she knows you're always there and with her family and her friends. And, and you know, I just, I pray that you take her under your wing and that she just continues to grow in you and love you and learn to follow after your heart. And I just, I'm so honored that we got to have her as a part of our family and that she'll always be a part of my family. Um, I just thank you for her future, and I know it's going to be an amazing, grand future, and I, I just pray for her on this road wherever you may lead her. Amen. Lord, I thank you so much for the joy it is to know Avery. What a beautiful heart you've given her, God, one that is keenly in tune with your creation and a unique ability to care deeply for our world, animals, and nature. I pray your blessing, God, over this next chapter of her life. I thank you for her faith and the way that her parents have provided her with an amazing foundation grounded in you. I thank you for Paul and Jill's care to navigate and provide for Avery a rich circle of influence in her childhood. Experiences, education, and relationships that have continued to point her to you and strengthen her walk. I pray now, God, that as Avery begins this new chapter of her life, you'd give her godly wisdom as she views the world through an adult lens and takes a new role of ownership over her circle of influence. Would you guide her and draw her close to friendships and mentors that build her up and bring her a familiar sense of the foundation which has already been laid for her? I pray that as she looks towards the future, it would be with great excitement and anticipation for the good things you have for her. I pray confidence for her that she would know the reach of her witness as she continues to live for you. I pray that when she arrives at NNU next fall, that she would find favor with her professors and fears, peers, that academic experiences would be new and rich. I pray that you'll protect her heart from loneliness, fear, and uncertainty and replace those things with joy, peace, and comfort. That she would park her thoughts on you and on your truth. That her mind would sit squarely on this new experience of adulthood, dwelling on all that is honorable, just, pure, and lovely. May she easily toss aside the bad and cling to what is good. May virtue and praise echo in her mind and be reflected in her words and actions. I pray that you will give her good communication skills as a young adult. 
When it's easier to muffle and stuff out words because of fear and uncertainty, may Avery be brave and always allow godly communication its opportunity. If she faces tough conversations, I pray strength and perseverance for her. Mostly important, Lord, may she continue to communicate with you regularly. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would continue um, to speak clearly to her, that she would hear your voice say, this is the way, walk in it. Let the words of her mouth and the meditations of her heart be pleasing to you, God. And above all, can Avery walk into this new phase of life, knowing full well and with confidence who she is and whose she is. Blessed and highly favored of you. Amen. We're going to continue and close out the service by singing the blessing. And I'd encourage you to sing it over each other, especially our grads. And so let's stand as we close out the service today. <laughs> 